1 Samuel chapter 19 is where we resume our study. Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth in Jesus' name. Amen. And Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants, that they should kill David. Saul's plot to kill David through the Philistines didn't work. Actually, it backfired. In fact, everything that he tries to do against David backfires. The harder Saul tried to put David to death, the more popular he became. And consequently, the king now orders his servants, including his son, Jonathan, to kill David. Too. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, seeks to kill you. Now, therefore, I pray you, take heed to yourself until the morning and abide in a secret place and hide yourself. Jonathan disobeyed his father because his father was sinning and wanted him to sin also. Family harmony is good but it is not as good as doing right in the eyes of God. In other words, holiness before God is more important than happiness in the family. Three, and I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will commune with my father of you. And what I see, that I will tell you. And I'm sure Jonathan loved his dad, although that relationship is definitely strained. He loved him, but he's not going to sin for him. And I don't care how much we like someone, we have to draw the line at sin and say, I won't do it. And so Jonathan is helping David, not killing David. For And Jonathan spoke good of David unto Saul his father, and said unto him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David because he has not sinned against you and because his works have been to you word very good. There was no legitimate reason to kill David, so Jonathan speaks up for him. No one is helping David except his friend Jonathan. You stand by someone when no one else does and chances are you're going to have a friend for life. And that's why Jesus should be the best friend of every Christian on a, in, in practice. He stands by us even though we sin and do not deserve to be on friendly terms with God. 4 and 5. Jonathan spoke good of David unto Saul his father and said unto him, Let not the king sin against his servant against David because he has not sinned against you. And because his works have been to you word very good. For he did put his life in his hand and slew the Philistine. And the Lord wrought a great salvation for all Israel. You saw it and did rejoice. Wherefore then will you sin against innocent blood and kill to kill David without a cause? Saul's sinful self-focus caused him to ignore David's goodness toward him. And consequently Saul became ungrateful. One of the best ways to avoid sin is to remain thankful for all that God has done. The more we remember God's goodness, the less likely we are to sin against him and the worse we're going to feel if we do sin. And that's a good thing. 6. And Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan. And Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be killed Jonathan, Jonathan reels Saul back into reality, at least for the time being. Took a lot of talking, but Saul finally admits that David should not be put to death. Seems like Saul always wanted to live in non-reality, where everything he wanted was okay, and it always took a lot to reel him back into reality. 7. And Jonathan called David... And Jonathan showed him all those things, and Jonathan brought David to Saul. 
and he was in his presence as in times past. And as I said before, I'm sure Jonathan loved his dad, and we know that David was his best friend. As a result, Jonathan tries to, tries his best to get these two to get along. It looks like he's succeeding too, at least for now. Eight, and there was war again. And David went out and fought with the Philistines and slew them with a great slaughter, and they fled from him. In the past, David stirred up Saul's hatred when he defeated Israel's enemies and defended God's honor. But that didn't stop David from doing it again. The Bible says that we are not to be weary in well-doing. We might not be appreciated for doing good. We may even be repaid evil for our good, but we should not stop doing good. Nine, and the evil spirit from the Lord was sent upon Saul. And he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand, and David played the harp. That's what he was playing. David played with his hand. There's really no good reason for a man to be sitting in his house listening to music with a javelin in his hand. Why would you do that? So when you think about it, there was no good reason for David to be in this situation. It'd be like sitting in the home of a sniper and trying to relax while he's across the room from you holding a loaded rifle. 10. And Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence, <clears throat> excuse me, and he smote the javelin into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. Saul swore that David would not be murdered, and yet here he is trying to murder David himself. The Bible says that a man's heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Do not entrust yourself to someone who has a dishonest track record. You don't know people like that you trust simply because they have said, I changed. That means nothing. 11. Saul also sent messengers unto David's house to watch him and to kill him in the morning. And Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, If you save not your life tonight, tomorrow you shall be slain. David has to sneak away under the cover of darkness before morning, or he's a dead man. David's wife found out about the plot and warned him, going against her own father. You know, if someone is being treated unfairly, and we have the means to help them, then it is God's will for us to do that. 12. So Michael let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. Remember, Saul gave David his daughter Michael to trap him. Turns out she helped David escape the trap. You know, God has this great ability to take what the enemy means for bad and turn it around and use it for good. And he did it right here. 13. And Michael took an image and laid it in the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster and covered it with a cloth. And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, he is sick. And I would not say that God approved of Michael's sin of lying, but he used it. God does not need our sins to accomplish his will. She may have meant well, but God did not need her sin to save David. 15. And Saul sent the messengers again to see David, saying, bring him up. To me in the bed that I may kill him. Saul wants his thugs to haul David over to his palace in his sick bed, as he as he thought it was, so that Saul can kill him. You know, the fact that David was evidently so sick that he couldn't get out of bed didn't seem to matter to Saul. He would slaughter a helpless man in cold blood laying on his sick bed. 
an innocent man, a good man. So if Saul thinks that David is that sick, he, it's interesting, he would not even be content to let nature kill David. He wanted to do it himself. 16. And when the messengers were come in, behold, there was an image in the bed with a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster. The thugs realized that there was a decoy in David's bed. Deceptions work sometimes, but even when they work, it's only temporary. They only work for so long. Sooner or later, the truth comes out. Deceptions do not change reality. At best, they put off the day of reckoning. And the deception of David's wife has now been discovered. 17. And Saul said unto Michael, Why have you deceived me so, and sent away my enemy that he escaped? And Michael answered Saul, He said unto me, Let me go. Why should I kill you? <clears throat> well, she's being real flexible with the truth here. When she was with David, she stood with David. But when she was with David's enemies, she stood with his enemies. She was all things to all people for her own benefit. Lesson, if someone is willing to lie for you, do not, do not be surprised if they lie to you. 18. So David fled and escaped and came to Samuel to Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and dwelt in Naoth. According to Psalm 116, David was afraid at this time and discouraged. So it was a good time to talk with Samuel. Talking to someone who will give you God's perspective will put you in a place where the Lord can reel your mind back in and give you peace. 19. And it was told Saul, saying, Behold, David is at Naoth in Ramah. And Saul's messengers, Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as appointed over them, the Spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul, and they also pro prophesied. And when it was told Saul, he sent other messengers, and they prophesied likewise. And Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they prophesied also. doesn't matter if a person is saved or unsaved. God can twist and turn that person so that they will do what he wants them to do. These guys came to attack David, but instead they prophesied the word of God. Pays to stay on God's side, doesn't it? 22, then went he also to Ramah and came to a great well that was in Seku, and he asked and said, Where are Samuel and David? And one said, Behold, they be at Naoth and Ramah. And he went there to Naoth and Ramah, and the Spirit of God was upon him also, and he went on and prophesied until it came to, he came to Naoth and Ramah. Remember, remember this. In the Old Testament, when the Holy Spirit came upon someone, it was for them to do what God wanted them to do. Period. At many times, I mean, the Spirit of God came on a donkey and he spoke. Many times, like with Saul, the people did not even know the Lord. They weren't even saved. And so here, Saul is on his way to murder David, but the Holy Spirit intercepts him and causes him to prophesy the Word of God instead. Same thing happened with Balaam. 24. And he stripped off his clothes also and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Wherefore they say, is Saul also among the prophets? The clothes he removed were his royal clothing and his armor. He wasn't totally stripped down. But without his special royal clothing, it was as if he was. So we see God detoured Saul in order to buy his servant David some time.